Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Middle Bar School Committee meeting for the first meeting of June. Um, as we have done in the past, people can put their comments um, in for public comment. Um, we're going to move right into the reports from school committee members. I do want to say something first. Uh, Meg couldn't make it tonight, but Meg did ask me to make to say on her behalf that she she can't express it how impressed she was with graduation ceremony on Saturday, and wanted to thank Hutch and his team, and Brandon and his team. Everything was run so well and beautifully. Um, she really appreciated what they had done. And so she asked me to say that and I couldn't agree with her more, um, but I'll turn it over. Any other school committee members have anything they want? Miss Farley, go right ahead. Certainly to uh, echo those sentiments, Mr. Young, um, but as a parent of a graduate handing him his, his diploma was uh, certainly a moment I will not soon forget. So thank you to everyone for all their hard work. Um, thanks for just getting them out there. They, that moment was really something special for everybody. And we know that a lot of work went into giving them those moments from prom to senior class assembly to awards night and then culminating with graduation. So I was um, just really pleased to be a part of all of it and honored. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oakley, go right ahead. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> I had three things uh, before, um, before you read Meg's um, but now I have two and I just want to say, I totally agree that the ceremony was awesome and everything was set up so nice. Um, but uh, the, the second thing that I had was, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to go out there and to just be in the presence of that type of energy. Uh, I, I have a feeling that if you measured the height of the hats when they throw them, that this year was a, a little higher than most years uh, after the year that they've had. Um, and then just finally, um, I appreciated uh, all of the, the the work that led to this um, superintendent, Principal Brannigan and, and, and everyone. And just thank you for allowing us school committee members to go out there. It's just so exciting. Thank you, Mr. Oakley. Mr. Stevens, go right ahead. I just want to say that I went to um, Wednesday. They had a That's E. Uh, co uh, it was the COVID uh, quarantine edition. And my daughter, a friend, was in one of the, the play mini. There was like ten mini plays, and it was great. Uh, you could tell they were excited. There was the first performance I think they were able to do since quarantine started. So they were very excited to be in the in the new auditorium with a, with a live audience, and it was it was very nice. So um, again, just enjoying the new space, and uh, everybody was happy to be there. And we should um, mention too that both the graduation and that's the year online and people can take a look at those and watch them themselves. So please do that. I know they're on the district's Facebook page and I'm sure they're on the YouTube page too. So please take some time. Anybody else have anything before we move on? So with that tonight, I'm gonna to turn it over to the superintendent for the superintendent's report. So Brian, it is your floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening to you and good evening to members of the committee. Uh, I too just want to say a quick hello to and a thank you to uh, Paul Brannigan and his staff, uh, his administration, uh, also to uh, Jim Hutch, Director of Facilities and their crew. I sort of jokingly made reference to it the other night at graduation that the maintenance and custodial staff become the Paul Brannigan production events staff uh, during the last two weeks. and, and uh, uh, you know, they did so certainly willingly and, and they just do a real nice job. Uh, I can't also mention this without mentioning Sean Siciliano and Adam Pelletier for their video and AV production and everything they did. Um, you know, Sean helped out in an emergency. Again, I made reference to Mr. Microphone, uh, but he saved the day the other night when a battery uh, ran awry in one of the microphones in the middle of one of the student speeches. And, and Mandy Buchan did a great job in sort of rolling with it. Uh, which was great. Um, that's probably why she's in the leadership position she's in. Um, so we thank Mandy. She did another couple of great speeches uh, on that night and on graduation. And we've heard, also heard her speak at the ribbon cutting and not the ribbon cutting, the grand opening um, and the, at, at every effort that we've ever had to have a student speaker. She's been right there and done a really nice job. So uh, thank you to her. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and members of the committee, my first agenda item is COVID-19 update. I first want to give you encouraging news that last year on our dash, last week on our dashboard on Friday, we had posted one uh, total case in the entire district. Uh, we anticipate that tomorrow that number will be zero. 
Um, so our mitigation strategies have been working. The society's mitigation strategies have been working. Uh, social distancing has been working, um, et cetera. So uh, looking forward to that big zero on that uh, on that COVID dashboard tomorrow. And and obviously that is something that we we will uh, we've been looking forward to for for a good long time. Haven't seen that zero uh, in a long time. Uh, so that's basically my COVID-19 update. I did want to mention the fact I wanted to thank the students and parents in the district, especially students. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday were very warm days. With warm days come warm schools. And uh, the schools that we don't have air conditioning in, um, uh, those students are even warmer. And we appreciate that. We did have some absenteeism slightly increased. Uh, we did have parents dis dismissing their kids. And I've, I've always maintained, and we continue to maintain, that in safety, if a parent feels their child's safety, like in the middle of winter, in a blizzard or whatever it might be, uh, if they feel their child's safety is in danger, that's an excused absence. They can pull their child from school or not send their child to school and write a note in, and that's an excused absence. Uh, that any parent can do that. So, uh, but we had a large, large majority of our students who were in and who sort of fought through this, uh, and we increased breaks and things such as that, and had some additional mitigation strategies. Um, the chiller at the MEC, a certain portion of the MEC did go down and we have to replace that. That's a $200,000 item that would hopefully be able to replace that with, with some of the federal stimulus money that came through with COVID uh, and looking forward to that. So that's my COVID update. If you have any questions, I'll certainly answer them at this time. Anything for the superintendent? Seeing none and hearing none, I can certainly move forward with um, the school choice window. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, pursuant to your vote, we have registered as a school choice district that had to be done by June 1st. As of June 7th, our school window, our school choice window opened up and will close on June 18th at 5 p.m. Um, if we fill all of our seats and have more, then we'll have a lottery uh, and that lottery will occur shortly thereafter. Um, and then that is on the website, that is clearly noted on the website for all to see. And uh, those are some important dates. If we don't fill all the seats, uh, then we will have a second lottery in August. Uh, and that will basically conclude what we're going to do as a district in, in sort of placing school choice students. Again, uh, the school window is open now. It will close at 5 p.m. on June 18th. And then on Tuesday, June 22nd at 9 a.m. at this office, the central office on Flora Clark, uh, Flora Clark School, at uh, 30 Forest Street, we will have a lottery if necessary. We haven't needed one in the past, um, but uh, our school choice numbers have, are up and, and we may we may require one. So if that's the case, then all those parents will be notified and a blind lottery will take place at that point. Um, again, if we don't fill all the students, the second round lottery will take place um, in, in August, late August. So it will be opened up again and I will certainly keep the school committee informed of that. Any questions with regard to the school choice window? Any okay, questions? thank you very much on that. Um, move forward with uh, planning for summer programs. And, and I, I, I have a uh, exciting update for you this evening. And I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Gates, uh, Scott Dawson, and Christy Goldman into the picture. Uh, we have some exciting news that I'm going to let Dr. Gates, who's been doing yeoman's work on this program, working with the folks here, and have her introduce the folks you see before you and uh, introduce this program. So, Dr. Gates, thank you and welcome, and welcome to Scott and Christy also. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch. We're super excited to present this opportunity to you and the school committee and our greater community. Um, we are super excited to share with you that we are launching a summer splash program, which will be a summer enrichment program for our rising first and sixth grade students. Um, so what is summer splash? Uh, as I said, it's going to be for our current K through five, which means our rising first and second uh, sixth grade students. And this program is going to focus on the acronym SPLASH, which is STEM, play, literacy, arts, social, emotional, and health. Um, this is our effort to you know, address um, the learning gaps in a fun and engaging way. We believe in Middleborough that uh, emphasizing learner behaviors and student engagement is what will drive student achievement. And we see this as an opportunity to support that. 
And I think one of the great things that we're going to be able to offer in our first year with Summer Splash, and I say first year because we're super hopeful to be able to offer this program for many years to come. But in our first year, due to um, financial support through um, the state, through the Mass Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, we're going to be able to offer this program for free for our students. And we're really excited to be able to bring this forward for our kids. Um, I'm very proud to announce that this program also adheres to our guiding principles that we've established of well-being, relationships, and learning. And we did a little bit of a rebrand on what well-being means. In the context of COVID, we certainly emphasize safety first, and we still do in all that we do. But we wanted to take well-being from just really a sole focus on um, safety to really looking at the whole child and looking at mindfulness practices, um, looking at taking care of our physical and mental well-being. And I think our Summer Splash program um, that you'll learn about through our two wonderful Summer Splash coordinators um, in Mr. Scott Dawson and Ms. Christy Goldman, I think you'll understand a little bit about how um, this, our, our, our new twist on well-being um, as represented in this graphic uh, comes through. So with that, as I said, I'm super proud to announce our Summer Splash coordinators. Um, these two have jumped right in with both feet and have made a tremendous splash with this program. They've already put in a tremendous amount of hours just this week um, in organizing the courses um, and creating the structure for this program. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Ms. Christy Goldman and Mr. Scott Dawson. Thank you, Dr. Gates. I'll just introduce myself quickly. My name is Miss Christy Goldman. My current role is the Mary Kay Good Schools fourth grade remote academy teacher for this year. Um, I like arts and crafts, games, and singing. My dislikes are rainy days at camp, and my special superpowers are turning that frown upside down and keeping a neat spreadsheet. And I'm Scott Dawson. I'm uh, currently one of the two music teachers at HBB, and I like making people's lives a little bit better, 10% better every time that we meet. That's, that's what I try to do. Awesome. So next I'm going to tell you a little bit about the people who will be serving our students in our Summer Splash program. And we're very proud that our Summer Splash program is going to be run by members of our Middleborough Public Schools faculty and staff. And we're going to be serving our own students this summer. Um, and what's really great about what we've been able to bring together is that our educators and our ESPs and our food services workers, our maintenance workers, our nurses are all going to be from within middle from within Middleborough, but bringing together all of our schools. So as you can see on the screen here, we have members from the MEC, MKG, HBB, NMS, and MHS all working together to create this awesome summer for our students. When and where will our Summer Splash program happen? Our Summer Splash program is a five-week program happening from July 12th to August 12th, and it will be hosted at the Henry B. Birkeland School from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Mondays through Thursdays. And we wanted to give you an idea of our general daily schedule. What will Summer Splash look like if you as a student would like to come and join us or, you know, you are looking to promote this with your student as a family member. So in the mornings, we'll have our check-in and breakfast. And our morning meeting, our goal is to really start the day with intention. As Dr. Gates was explaining, a huge focus of our program is going to be on mindfulness practice and making sure we are intentional with how we start our day so that we can create the best summer we possibly can at Summer Splash. So we're going to come together for those moments, starting the day with intention in the morning. Then students will go to their session one class. These are those core courses that have been developed and offered by the amazing faculty and staff here in the Middleborough Public Schools. So they will have a first option for a first course. After their first class ends, we'll come back together to practice our mindfulness and improve, you know, that whole child approach of addressing well-being within the academic environment that can be super engaging. Then we'll move to our second session course where students will have the opportunity to try something else maybe that interests them from our awesome program of studies. And 
after that, we are going to have a combined movement break and lunchtime, and we'll be able to end our day with gratitude together to make sure we are remembering what we're here to do as a team at Summer Splash. So the individual sessions is really where the magic is going to happen and where our staff is really going to shine. And it's really a testament to the staff here at Middleborough that after such a trying year that so many staff were like, let's go, sign me up for some more. Let's do some summer work. And we have some really great activities and sessions for the kids. Lots of science-based, lots of movement, yoga, lots of art-based, lots of music-based. It's really going to be an eclectic program that kids are going to be able to choose uh, their first choice about which session or which course they would like to participate in. Of course, there will be caps on how many students will be in each course. And so uh, those are subject to availability and room as, uh, as well. But you can see it's so creative by what all the teachers have come up with, whether it's teddy bears, math Olympics, cardboard creations, it's gonna be a very well-rounded program for the kids to choose what they'd like to do. The big, one of the big obstacles that we're going to be trying to hurdle over here in the next day or two is trying to get this word out to the public because I know that my kids, I've already signed them up for camps for the summer. And so we need to get this uh, out into the community as soon as possible. Um, we've made some, started making some flyers. These are going to be hopefully going home here on Tuesday folders. We're working on a website that we're going to be pushing out to uh, all the social media that Middleborough uses, as well as the websites. We're going to be shouting it from the rooftops, trying to get as many kids to involved as we can. So as I said, we're trying to get it started. Uh, registration, we're hoping, is going to open early next week. Uh, Ms. Goldman, Ms. Dr. Gates has been absolutely phenomenal. They're so well-minded on how to organize this. And so we're hoping to get registrations open. Um, enrollment will be first come, first serve, because we will have caps. And specific se sessions and courses are subject to change, because I don't know if you've noticed this year, but things change. So. We're going to try our best to keep uh, the plan that we've got going, but we're all flexible thinkers here and we're going to be able to roll with whatever punches might be thrown at us. Thank you, Scott and Christy, for providing that overview of our program. And if I may, um, I'm seeing some questions just come in through the chat. And uh, of course, our programming is going to be inclusive. Um, we also still are hosting our extended school year program as well. Um, but Summer Splash is certainly open to um, all students within the Middleborough Public Schools that are currently in kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, just scanning the questions, if I may, um, you know, kids that will need support with accommodations, absolutely. We're all educators and we're going to um, take care of our kids and give them the best experience possible. Um, there, the, lottery, the sign up is first come, first serve. Um, we will be deploying a Google form to our website, and our goal is early next week. Uh, Monday is our hope. Tuesday uh, being the real true goal to make sure we get it out there. Um, so it is going to be first come, first serve, and we will be able to identify the time to which people have submitted their requests based upon the timestamps provided through Google Forms. Um, unfortunately, there is no transportation provided, so families would need to provide transportation to and from the program. Um, there is currently going to be no fees associated with the first year of Summer Splash due to a matching grant um, that Middleborough is applying for for this program. And I think I might have gotten all the questions associated to the camp, but if I did not, Chair Young, please uh, feel free to direct those questions to us. And myself, uh, Mr. Dawson and Ms. Goldman are here to answer any additional questions. So thank you. Yeah, I think you answered everything that was related to the, um, the summer program. Uh, first of all, I, I just want to say thank you to everybody for working hard on this. I know um, it has been a difficult year for the teachers and for the everybody to be able to step up and to participate in this is fantastic, especially since we can offer it for free to students uh, who sign up. Um, so thanks to everybody for that. I know 
Um, we all know how difficult it's been. And so to pick up a little extra for all of you really makes is going to make a difference. And I think we'll make a difference for a lot of uh, these kids. So thank you very much for that. Does any other board member have questions? Mr. Oakley, go right ahead. Yeah, just wanted to first thank you all for, for this. This sounds like an awesome opportunity. And, and how awesome is it that it's free and for Middlebrook kids and uh, lunch included? Just sounds so awesome. Um, my, my question for you was, um, given the, the number of teachers and staff and all that, um, is there a max number of kids that you, you'll be able to handle uh, through the program? Uh, yes, we've been working on identifying our caps for each course, and they do vary uh, depending upon the type of course. Um, we have some, um, for example, like backyard games that we think can be at a little bit of a higher threshold than maybe some of our other courses that might be limited by uh, the particular equipment we have, if it's some of our music programming or um, some of the others. But uh, Ms. Goldman, I think you probably had the most uh, intimate work with our course offerings, and you might be able to expand upon that if you feel uh, if you feel that you can of course so we are going to try our best given that this year we can offer this program to our community for free which is so amazing we're going to try our best to bring in as many kids as we can safely do and as we can with uh following all of our covid restrictions that we still have to adhere to this year so we're going to take a look as our enrollment starts coming in as people fill out our form and as many kids as we can possibly service, we are going to do that. So I'm very confident that we'll be able to reach a big population of Middleborough this year and we can always keep growing. So next summer, we're hoping to keep this program moving and growing to reach even more students in the future. Excellent, thank you so much. Mr. Stevens, I'm not sure if I missed this or not, but this will be mostly outdoors. So there'll be no masks required outdoors because that's the current uh, guidelines? So it really depends on the student and in which course they enroll. If you're in a course like backyard games, we can obviously uh, accommodate that happening outside without masks per the state guidelines. However, if you're going to enroll in a course like exploring chemistry and work on some labs with our awesome staff, that might be a course that needs to be running indoors with our equipment and Yes, during that time that we are indoors, we will be adhering to social distancing and masking rules. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, Chairman Young, I did see a question that I neglected in the chat um, from uh, Mrs. Lee Bowens, um, and she asked, could you sign up for certain weeks only or all? And yes, absolutely, you can sign up for certain weeks, or certain sessions, or all of the above. Um, and you'll, you'll be able to see that delineated in the form um, to enroll um, your children. So I just want to make sure I address that question. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to Dr. Gates and, and Scott Dawson and Christy Goldman. Uh, we are excited as a school district about this program and moving it forward. And um, exciting about it, it being a first year, sort of a pioneer year, if you will, and looking forward to hopefully many more years to come. As you know, the sharp two week program ended um, and we were looking for something to provide some enrichment along with aligned with some some frameworks and some activities. And uh, this is just the ticket right now. So we're looking forward to this this year and hopefully many years to come. And again, thank you to those folks that that organize this. So <clears throat> and I want to uh, move on, Mr. Chair, if it's OK with you. Uh, I, want to introduce, I want to introduce the fact that at Nichols Middle School and at Middleborough High School, we will also have programming coming up and that will be introduced uh, at the next school committee meeting. Um, and it will be sent out via social media also. Uh, some of it's credit recovery, uh, but others of it will be uh, tied in with the grant that we're trying to put in with the state so that we're trying to get at least low cost, no cost programs for our students at all levels. Um, and that is that is our hope, certainly moving forward. So uh, there'll be more information on that. Uh, obviously, the high school and the middle school have been involved heavily with uh, oh promotion activities and and all everything else that's going on in their schools. And uh, they've been working on it, but but not one hundred percent. And they do not have a summer directors that would be run by the principals. So uh, thank you to that. So if there's nothing else, I will certainly move on. Our next agenda item is uh, school improvement plans. 
Uh, for the committee's information, uh, probably some of you who have been on the committee are aware of this, but Ed Reform created chapters, Mass General Law Chapter 71, Section 59C, School Councils, uh, which states that at each public elementary, secondary, and independent vocational school in the Commonwealth, there shall be a school council. And what this, it further states that the school council shall meet regularly with the principal of the school and shall assist in the identification of educational needs of the students attending the school in the review of the annual school budget and the formation of school improvement plans as provided below. And it goes into detail about what a school improvement plan is. Basically, it's a, a group of goals uh, specifically designed for a school. Uh, I've asked each, uh, para, each principal, excuse me, uh, to develop a survey and uh, at each level, and many of them do it with parents, and some of them actually involve the students, uh, and they develop their school improvement plans based on those. So this evening, we're going to hear each principal uh, provide a piece of their plan at the elementary level. It will be more of a, a, a sort of a three-in-one here with, with Jeremy Gobeil and Lisa White and, and Derek Thompson, uh, principals of each of the three elementary schools presenting uh, their goals and pieces of their goals with some subitum information provided by each. Uh, and then we'll go to uh, Heidi Latender at the Nichols and then Paul Brannigan at the high school. So I'll begin by inviting uh, our elementary crew in. Uh, hopefully we can fit all three of them in. Excellent. I can see you all and hopefully you're on. And welcome uh, Jeremy Gobeil, Lisa White, and Mr. Thompson. And uh, if there are no other questions in terms of the introduction, I will have them take it away. Mr. Gobeil, you're on. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you, school committee members. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I, um, I just want to echo the sentiments of the Summer Splash program. I, I'm really excited about it. I think summer is a great opportunity for, for uh, students and families to, to be involved and, and for, for our faculty and staff to be involved in some fun learning and uh, adventures for the kids. Um, I would like to start with um, thanking my, my school council this year, my first year as a principal. They've been very patient. <laughs> They've been um, very supportive. And it, it's a team that's been together, I think, for a couple of years. And I, and I really appreciate their, their wisdom. Um, it's been great to have a group of stakeholders who are so invested in our school, uh, brainstorm ways to get our school uh, to, a, to a better place and, and always looking for improvement. So Mr. Thompson and uh, Ms. White, Ms. White and I have um, worked very closely this year to um, develop our school improvement plans. And you'll see that they're, if you, if you haven't seen them already, you'll see that they're very similar. Um, there are definitely some, some things that are unique to each building, um, but essentially there are, are structures in place within each of our uh, plans that that underlie some really common themes and strategies um, that 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 we're going to work work towards in the next year, year, couple couple of years, anyway. Um, you will um, you'll see these, and and and, and um, each of us are, are taking a little bit of a different approach here. And, and by the time the three of us end up presenting, we hope that you'll have some questions for us. Uh, but basically, they're they're really similar plans. Um, each one of each one of our plans include three goals. Basically, trying to get back to basics, and and we have um, a, a literacy goal, a math goal, and a social emotional learning goal, um, which um, Mr. Thompson and Mrs. Ms. White will elaborate a little bit further on. I'll talk a little bit about things that are specific to the Memorial Early Childhood Center, um, but they, these plans all tie back together. So, essentially, um, for for I, I just put some bullets here. Getting back to the Leslie literacy model, um, we this year has been challenging um, in regard to how that has has worked. Um, it's it's been kind of counterproductive to everything that the restrictions have put on us this year um, in regard to collaboration, students collaborating together and sharing, and 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 with with everything with covid we've been kind of been told like don't look at each other don't touch each other <laughs> stay away from each other don't talk to each other it's been quite a challenge so uh, we want to get back on track with with our leslie literacy model um including our professional development um our coaching 
workshop models. Um, we want to make sure that we're in, engaging in quality literacy materials and, and resources and literature. Um, the focus on professional learning community for me as a school is really, you know, breaking down any kind of walls of isolation and having our staff be humble as learners and, and be able to talk to each other about um, what it is that, that, that I, need, I need help in, I need support in, as well as um, I, I talk about calibration. So when we look at like common assessments, when we look at assessments across the school that um, our teachers are, you know, what one teacher sees as a, you know, as, as an example, a rating of a two, the, the rest of our staff are working um, together to, to see the same thing and be on the same page with that. With that. We also talk about RTI, which is response to intervention. The big piece of this to me is really targeting our interventions based on the assessments. So when we assess our students, we really get to know where their strengths are and where their need areas are and really targeting um, our interventions based on, based on these. Another piece of this is balanced um, technology. This year has certainly been a challenge in regard to the fact that we had kids, you know, remote learning and even this meeting now, how much technology do we want our students to be in, engaged in versus when we have them face to face? So as an example, when our kids at, at MEC came back to school, the majority of the kids came back full time face to face. We, we really didn't want them on technology. We didn't want them on tablets. We didn't want them on devices. We wanted to use that time as much as possible as face-to-face. -face. Um, and so, so in all areas, in all three of our goals, really balancing that, that technology. Dr. Gates, please. Thank you. Um, a huge part of our goal Goal for goals for this year, this coming year, in, involve social emotional learning, and we really want to provide faculty meeting time, professional learning community time, professional development on social emo social emotional learning and training. Um, you know, there are so many aspects of this that that you know this year has really had such an impact on, and, and what has happened with us. Um, the other piece is another piece is focusing on learner behaviors. And not so much as you know memorizing things, but but teaching our kids how to be learners, including things like organization and perseverance, responsibility, taking initiative, um, starting that that first step, and and having their social interactions. So those learner behaviors and things that we really want to focus on. And I, it always comes back to me about um, that that poem or that poster about everything I needed to learn in life. I learned in kindergarten and that has just not been the case this year. We have signs up in our school that talk about social distancing and not sharing things. And that is so the opposite of, I believe the way our kids are supposed to learn. So another piece of this is, is our family night presentations. We're in the process of trying to figure out um, who our presenters will be and what we wanna focus on in regard to having families. Um, we've had some great success with, with some of our presenters in the past few years around things like attention deficit, hyperactive disorder, or anxiety, dyslexia, executive functioning, autism, you know, anything um, that, that we can help our, our families understand and, and support, as well as with our staff. Dr. Gates, or Mr. Siciliano, sorry. <laughs> I wanted to just, just chat a little bit quickly about um, our survey data. So we did put out a survey as our, our school council. Um, I did have 16 staff responses. I was a little bit disappointed in that. I was hoping to have more, but um, that, that's fine. We had 91 family res families respond. Um, and essentially just to break it down really quickly in general terms, um, some of the positive results is that in general, most of our staff and our families believe that that our kids are in pretty good shape academically they're they're okay they're going to be ready they're going to be ready um, for next year which is which is positive you know that was a big concern of ours certainly our teachers learned new strategies um, one of the things that, that that they had identified was that they're going to take things away 
from this year that they will use in the future and that there are some really good things that, that they could take away from um, this year that, that, that will benefit us going forward. There's obviously been some strong homeschool connections. Um, and, and in combined with that, I think the compassion for teachers and families, meaning that um, teachers have a newfound um, discovery, I guess, for what families are dealing with. And families, the, the feedback that we've, we've gotten is that they, they can't believe the amount of work that, that our teachers in, have done and do on a daily day basis, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, couple of the sort of negative results was that technology issues, and we kind of knew that was coming. Um, there were a lot of glitches that, that happened, whether it was um, connectivity issues or device issues or, or whatever, but just the fact that, and, and I imagine some of you dealt with this as well, was you know, my, my computer's not working or I can't connect to that, that um, Google Meet, um, those kind of things. Um, and I kept telling my staff all year long and families as well, like it's okay. Like it's, it's, it's okay. We're doing, we're all doing the best that we can. And if, if, you know, your, your Wi-Fi is down, that's okay. Read a book to your child, like hang out with them, play a game with them. And that's okay. And then the other area of concern was the social concerns going forward. Um, again, going back to my, my, everything I, I, I needed to learn in life. I learned in kindergarten was, you know, you know, play nice in the sandbox and, and how to play and share and, you know, but it's been amazing. I, I watched some um, classes today. I was I was in a uh, couple of phys ed classes and watching some kids playing and what could have been a potentially um, competitive activity with kids kind of sort of playing horseshoes, but with with sand with with bags and and um, hula hoops. And they, I was just amazed that they were just cheering each other on and laughing with each other and really being very supportive and saying, "Oh, that was close enough. You get a point for that." So. Um, I, I am hopeful that, that things will be good going forward. So I think that's it. I know, I know we're going to have questions at the end, um, after Mrs. White and Mr. Thompson present, um, for the entire elementary school staff. But, um, if there's anything particular right now that I can answer, I'm happy to. Thanks, Mr. Gobeal. I think we're going to move on to Mrs. White, just as we had planned. So, uh, welcome Mrs. White and, uh, your turn. Thank you, Superintendent Lynch. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the school committee, the Middleborough community. Um, as we come to the end of a school year, uh, it's exciting to start talking about the next school year. Um, as you will note in Mr. Gobeil's plan, and he also noted um, the connection between the MEC and the complex. Well, it's important that every child receive the same high quality education, whether your child attends HBB or MKG. Mr. Thompson and I, along with the faculty of both schools and our central office, really supports this and makes this a priority. Our plans are written with our school councils, but that's a huge focus for them as well. Our plans are written to demonstrate the work at both schools and that the, the work is aligned. That is key, key for our teachers and our students to receive high quality learning and instruction throughout the district. Uh, I will be doing an overview of the of the plan that is very, like I said, very closely with with um, the plan at HBB, and Mr. Thompson will then take this the the plan and dive deeper into the structure of how the plan will be then implemented. The like to thank the members of the Mary Kay Good School Council specifically. Um, they're always great and understanding and come up with great ideas and and really you know push on how we can make our school the best school that it possibly can be. So thank you all for, for doing that. Next slide, please. Thank you. So goal number one is through a comprehensive partnership with Lesley University, we will improve literacy instruction and student performance for all students in grades one to five. Um, this will happen with the continuation of the implementation of the letter, let, excuse me, it's a little tongue twister, Leslie literacy model. Um, our professional development, our PD, will be focused on writing, word work, and foundational skills. PD for special education teachers in, uh, with our tier three supports, and Mr. Thompson will go a little deeper as to specifically those tier three supports. 
We're going to be working on developing um, schedules to ensure ongoing coaching and support for the coaching cycle. We're going to all be making sure that we're adhering to balancing our technology and literacy. We did learn some very valuable pieces this year. For example, you know, our footprints, uh, our students were able to access books online. And that's important for our students to have in, in the age that we're living in. So we, we don't want to give that up. We want to make sure that we're having a great marriage between what we're doing in class, face to face, small group, and also being able to bring in technology as well. We're going to continue to make sure that we have the professional materials and resources that our teachers need um, to give the, you know, the best instruction to our students. Next slide, please. Goal number one is continued. Um, we will also be adding additional texts and materials for students, both in class and in our uh, respective book rooms. Um, a big, big push for what we're looking at with bringing in um, our texts uh, is that they're free of cultural bias, ensuring that all students can see themselves in the curriculum with a goal to increase the diversity offered within and across our curriculum. Our professional learning communities will be focusing on analyzing data and sharing best practices. And I know um, I, I'll, I'll mention specifically at Mary Kay Good, um, through the teacher's contract, our teachers receive, we have three meetings a month, two of them being per, uh, PLCs. What we're going to be doing is I'm restructuring uh, part of the school day twice a month to add two additional PLCs. This is important work for us to be able to really dig deep with analyzing data. It's also going to give us additional time to do some professional development um, in areas such as um, identifying um, uh, students with disabilities and how we're working with um, giving our students in our general education and in our special education classrooms, um, you know, what they need to be successful. Also, the training for Leslie, making sure that we're having time built in to these PLCs for that as well. We're going to continue using our STAR 360 assessments, which we've been using gosh, for four years now, I think. Um, we will be doing those fall, winter, and spring, and that data is crucial. It allows us to see where we are and where we need to maybe hone our skills a little, maybe identifying some gaps that we need to improve on, and looking at where our students are excelling. Where are they excelling? Because that always happens. And what are we doing well? What do we need to push forward with? Supports for response to intervention, our RTI, model with Lexia, uh, reading recovery, level, our leveled literacy intervention, our after school clubs and tutoring. Next slide, please. Goal number two is to continue to align and implement curriculum instruction and assessment in mathematics to ensure improvement and growth with all students in grades one through five. And in in the area of math, we're going to be revising our curriculum maps. Um, a few years back, we worked with um, Susan Looney to create maps uh, in grades K through five, and they always need revising. They always need looking at. Um, so through our data, we, we look at, is, is it aligned to what we need it to be aligned to? And if it's not, then we need to make those adjustments along the way. Um, our professional development this year in mathematics will be focused in guided math which is um, aligns very nicely with what we're doing in Leslie with having small group instruction and guided math instruction. Just as we do in reading, we also use our STAR 360 assessment in fall, winter, and spring for the same purpose of analyzing data of where are, where are our students and who's excelling and who may need some additional supports. Our response to intervention, um, not only are we using our guided math and small groups, but we're also continuing with ST math as um, a way for our students to be able to have that conceptual understanding of mathematics. Our PLC meetings, again, we will not only have them in literacy, but we will also be having them in math to analyze data and share best practices among teachers. Our professional resources for teachers in the area of guided math um, teachers have received some materials um, in the past, but we're going to be digging a little deeper into, into this this year. Uh, provide a coaching model for teachers, as we have done with Leslie. We'd like to start looking at moving our coaching model also into the area of mathematics. Again, looking at a balance of technology and math. We have used ST Math uh, 
quite a bit in the last three years uh, to great success. Um, this year with, with our devices coming back and, and students not having devices in the classroom, which I know is going to be changing, um, that was a little difficult, but we're excited to get back to that. We saw some great gains with ST Math and we look forward to getting back to that. The returning of our after school clubs are all, is, is important and our intensive to after school tutoring um, will be crucial for our students with you know time that's been lost or if we see any students that are requiring some int intensive instruction or intensive tutoring, we'll be able to provide that after school for our students. Next slide, please. Our goal three is to foster an inclusive environment for students and families so that all students feel like they belong and are equipped with the social emotional learning skills required to meet with success. So professional development related to social emotional learning with SEL. Uh, Mr. Thompson and I actually are getting this work next week where we'll be, we'll be working together to um, meet with some some companies, some curriculum uh, regarding SEL and in the direction that we want to go in. So we're very excited that we're going to be looking at this and how we're going to be able to move forward with also providing our teachers with some professional development as well. And looking at mindfulness programs and PD to support teachers with the implementation of a mindfulness program in each of our schools. We're going to continue with the implementation of character strong and purposeful people. I know this has been around now for a few years and many of you have heard us talking about character strong and purposeful people. Um, I know at Mary Kay Good, um, we're very excited to bring back our town meetings. That's something we I know we've really missed. And for those of you that don't know what they are, um, we started this a few years ago um, that once a month we meet as a grade level, the entire student body grade level meets um, due to social distancing. We couldn't do that this year. We did, though, hold one last week, um, in, a week before, I'm sorry, in fifth grade. So that was exciting to have a town meeting outside. Um, we so look forward to having those back. Um, Mrs. McHugh has been recording our, our the, the, the things she would share in, in town meetings. She's been recording them for our students and our teachers to be able to have access to the information throughout the school year. But there's something said for meeting together as a grade level. Each grade has its own uniqueness and each grade level has its own um, personality and we like to meet with them and meet the needs. First grade needs are very different than fifth grade needs. And we really, really love having that time with our students. So we are so excited to have town meetings back for next year. Uh, we at Mary Kay Good have had um, RTI or uh, response to intervention in um, SEL, in our social emotional learning, and we will continue to do that. Um, we started a little bit of work pre-COVID with creating uh, level targets and expectation for learner beha behaviors. We, um, at the beginning, um, if you recall, when I did a presentation I, I, uh, regarding remote learning, um, seems like forever ago now, but we talked about what expectations were for remote learning. And I know some of the families had reached out to me that those were really well received because it was, this is what my child's expected to know, do, act, you know, on, on remote learning. So we want that same thing for the classroom. What are those targets? What are those expectations? What are those learning, learning behaviors that we're looking for? Because again, just like with remote learning, the expectation for grade two, a grade two student is very different than a grade four student. So really looking, what does that look like for each of our grade levels and each of our students? We're looking to increase our parent nights now that we can all be together again, which we're very excited about in the areas of literacy, math, executive functioning, anxiety, dyslexia. I'm very open um, if families have ideas and would like something um, or looking for something, I welcome, um, please, uh, I know Mr. Thompson and Mr. Gobiel as well, we're always looking for ideas and, and for parents to certainly join us and throw us some ideas. And if we can get a presenter or a speaker or someone that, you know, wants to do, um, you know, has a connection to something, we would be more than happy. We, we think that's a, that being able to meet those needs is, is wonderful. I know our, our um, CPAC has done that as well. And it, I know they, that's a great resource. Uh, we're going to continue to be meeting, um, having our morning meetings at Mary Kate Good. It's a time that students are allowed to share and students are allowed to have that community building, which is so important. 
we have used um, a SEL screener, a social emotional screener, and uh, we're looking at updating that um, as well for the coming school year. Next slide, please. So the family survey results at Mary Kay Good, um, I'll tell you, thank you, 254 responses, thank you. There were 22 indicators and I did um, pull out a few of them. They were all um, extremely well done. done. I, I was so blown away and I did share these with, with the teachers. Um, it was, even though it was a year of change and a year of uncertainty and a year of I felt like I was sending updates a lot. Um, the families, and I think I can speak for all three administrators, probably the, the district, but the families have been amazing. The, the families of Middleborough have been uh, incredible, um, you know, with, with emails that have gone out and I've sent, you know, we've sent things in newsletters that change, you know, we're in, we're out, you know, the hybrid and keeping up with everything. So thank you, thank you to the families and thank you to the teachers because they've been along, you know, along this road with us. And this just shows that that uh, ninety-eight percent strongly agreed and agreed that teachers have been supportive, accessible, and responsive to me. That was that speaks volumes to the teaching staff. Um, I, I and I don't think this is a, just a Mary Kay good thing. Um, Mr. Thompson and I compared data, and it was pretty amazing how right spot on aligned our data was we use the same survey for that reason we wanted to make sure we're comparing apples to apples and you know kudos to the teachers for being supportive and accessible and responsive to our families uh, my child's teacher or teachers were great about communicating with me 96 percent strongly agree and agree that's amazing my child feels welcome and part of the mkg community 96.8 that's, I, I call that like my proud mother moment. Like for a child to feel welcome in a school, that's my ultimate goal. I want our families and I want our kids to feel welcome. And, you know, we want our kids, we want our families to want to send their children to our school. So thank you for that. And I believe I'm turning the next piece over to Mr. Thompson, which is talking about the, how this plan will now the structure will now roll into play. So, hello everyone. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to start off also, thank you my school council, Mrs. Adler, Mrs. Silva, Mrs. Lazan, Mrs. Cooney, Mrs. Del Vecchio, Mrs. Cooley, and Mrs. Madigan. Um, this was a pretty strange year, putting the school improvement plan together and doing this all remotely, um, much like presenting the school improvement plan tonight remotely. It's, it's all been a little bit different. Very, um, it's been an interesting year to say the least. So, Sean, we're ready for the next slide. Um, so, when you read our plans, you know, in so many ways, it it just looks like a checklist of action steps that we're going to take. And you know, as you heard from both Mr. Gobile and Mrs. White, we have the same three goals basically in the three schools. So, uh, Sean, we can go to the next slide. So HBB is no different than the other two. We have the same goals. We work very closely. The action steps in the three schools are all essentially the same. And really the plans represent in many ways getting back to what we were doing before the pandemic that we know was working really well for us. Um, and so we just thought tonight it made sense for one of us to take a moment to talk about the structures that we've been working to implement in really all three schools that are laid out in the action steps in the plan, but are not readily, they may not necessarily be obvious when you're reading the plan. And so, and this is something, you know, I know for me here, I'd be going in my 10th year next year, we've been pretty consistent with this in building these these structures. And the, and the structures are, you hear us talk about it all the time, it's PLC, which is short for Professional Learning Communities. Um, PLC is not just a meeting, it is a culture that we're trying to establish in the building. And it's a culture of learning. It's a culture of collaboration, collective efficacy, and just really everybody trying to be a little bit better tomorrow than we were the day before. Um, collective efficacy has been proven to be the number one impact um, strategy that a, that a school can implement. And collective efficacy is when teachers get together and work together 
in a very specific kind of way. And that's when they're working together to make sure that the students are learning and they're really focusing on the results. And everyone, as you heard Mr. Gobiel use the term humbly, everyone can humbly look at their own impact on student learning and see if it's working or not. And if it's not, we can work together to learn and grow and figure out what we need to do to ensure that our kids are moving forward. Um, the other structure that we implement is called RTI and it's response to intervention. And it's really the way by which we look at our instruction and whether our kids are making progress or not. And it's really broken down into three tiers. So the first tier, all students are exposed to. That's our core instruction. So we want to make sure that we have high quality instruction. Um, and we've been really focused on that. So when you hear about things like the Leslie Initiative or math professional development um, the, or guided math, those are the things we're trying to do to improve in that area. Tier two is the interventions that, you know, roughly 20 to 30 percent of our kids are, are, are getting. Uh, you, you don't need an IEP for that. We're, we're looking at data. We're working to, together collaborative, collaboratively in our professional learning community. If we have a kid that's struggling, we're implementing interventions. That could happen in the room. That might happen in the morning during our walk to learn block, uh, or it might happen in tutoring or, or, um, or even some of our after school clubs that we, that we offer. And then tier three is when We've tried all these things, we're, wa we're watching the data, we're coming back, we're, we're doing what we call progress monitoring and it's not working. Then we start jumping to more intensive interventions, things like reading recovery or even possibly SPED. Um, we have what's called a child study team standing in all three buildings. So that is really the group that gets together that talks about those kids that we're just not sure about what we need to do. And we need, and you know, just the grade two PLC alone isn't sure what to do. So they'll bring a kid to child study team. We will sit and we will go even further and really unpack what we think we need to do within these tiers and implement interventions. And then another important part that I guess is a structure that we've been trying to implement is coaching in job embedded professional development, not just bringing outside providers, but building capacity within the building. Um, so you know, one of the things we've been doing when we talk about getting back to the Leslie model is building in two hour professional development sessions all through the year for our staff with coaching in between each session that happens while they're in the classroom, which is really important. So Sean, ready for the next slide. So within all of the action steps, which do look very consistent with past years, there's really three areas that we're really keyed in on this year more so than past years. The first, obviously, and I can't say this one actually is more than in past years, but high quality instruction will continue to be a big part of what we're doing. And you know, in a real big picture sense, what we're trying to do with our professional development is making sure that every teacher in a really deep way understands each individual child that's sitting in front of them. And that takes a lot of skill. We're, we're trying to really move beyond just teachers understanding content, but really understanding all the developmental needs kids have so that we can focus on what kids can do and we can move our instruction from being more compliance-based to one where we're building those learner behaviors that you heard Mrs. White and Mr. Gobiel talking about, which is things like perseverance, that intrinsic motivation in kids. You know, we're not just teaching kids to read, we want them to see themselves as readers. When kids see themselves as readers, they're picking up books outside of class. When we do a good job teaching reading, they read while they're in class. So we want kids to see themselves as writers, mathematicians, scientists, learners. We want them thinking, asking questions. And that takes a ton of skill from teachers. That's not an easy thing to do. And that's why the job embedded professional development and the coaching is so important. We're also excited about the two new curriculum positions that we will have an ELA in math because we do recognize we have a lot of work to do next year. Sean, we're ready for the next slide. In terms of thinking about tier two and tier three instruction, one of the things we've been talking about is acceleration, not remediation. Remediation to me means we start behind and our kids, you know, if we start behind, we're gonna stay behind. We don't need to take our third graders and walk them all the way back through second grade. We're never going to get our kids to where we need to go if that's how we approach this. So acceleration really means believing our kids can and making sure that our instruction is 
delivered in a way where we can give them access to the grade level standards, but we're supporting them, providing differentiation and scaffolds as needed. Again, focusing on what kids can do. Um, and that again comes through that job embedded professional development and coaching. And in this area, as we start to look more at the kids that are struggling, we are excited about our uh, new special ed support specialist, which is essentially a coach uh, for our special ed teachers, which I think is really important. So Sean, we're ready for the next slide. So again, I just going back as you look at this next slide, this is PLC and RTI coming together. So we are throughout this process assessing our kids and you heard both Mr. Gobiel and Mrs. White talk about different assessments that we'll be administering to kids, including a new SEL screener. So we're using that data. We're monitoring the progress of the kids. We're making adjustments in our PLC through you know, common planning and planning out those interventions. And then we're responding, delivering those interventions, providing tutoring through things like our Walk to Learn. So la next slide. The last area that we're going to be really keyed in on next year is focusing on the social emotional needs of our students. We recognize and we've, we've seen this as kids have come back. There's a lot of work to do in this area. Um, so one way we're going to focus on this, I heard Mrs. White talking about this a little bit, is within our curriculum. We're going to continue our work to make sure that we foster a sense of belonging within our curriculum. And we do that. We call it mirrors and doors. Kids need to be able to see themselves in the curriculum like they can in a mirror. And they can see the doors that will open them for themselves in the future. Um, so another way, and we talk about teachers need to understand the student that's sitting in front of them and develop them as readers and writers. Now, oftentimes a prerequisite to getting a kid to be able to read and write is to really understand that disability. And I heard both Mr. Gobiel and Mrs. White talking about that. If we don't understand issues like executive functioning, anxiety and trauma and how it manifests itself in the classroom, it we're not gonna meet the kids' needs because a student sitting in class, that is their, um, that is the first thing they need addressed and we need the skills and understanding in order to be able to do that so we're gonna we started this before the pandemic we're going to continue this work through professional development and studying these areas a little bit deeper um we are going to be improved we have sel screeners social emotional learning screeners so we look for our kids that are struggling or teachers think are showing signs of anxiety things like that we do that currently but we are looking to improve upon that a little bit uh, you heard mrs white talk about mindfulness um i think we've done a really good job when you look at the work that the schools have done in terms of creating a positive culture setting positive expectations teaching kids how to meet those positive expectations i really feel strongly that creating a culture centered around mindfulness is like the last step that we really need to focus on. Um, so I'm very excited about being able to do some of that work. And we will continue with uh, ensuring we have support groups and interventions for students that are struggling in the area of social emotional uh, needs. So, um, so those are the three key areas we're gonna be focusing on in the building, um, specifically as it relates to the plan and the structures overall in the building that, that are gonna help us achieve these goals. Thank you, Mr. Thompson, Ms. White, and uh, Mr. Gobiel. Uh, Derek, before it goes to the committee, can you explain uh, executive functioning to the committee and to folks at home who might not understand exactly what executive functioning is in a child? Quite briefly? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, thumbnail if you could. You know, I, I think, um, you know, it's really the ability to organize. There's a lot that can that can happen there. Um, I, and I'm certainly no expert in this area, but um, I do have a son that has ADHD, um, and I and I have learned um, a lot of things that he struggles with is imagining his future self and planning and organizing himself. Um, and I have been the parent on the receiving end of a lot of teacher notes over the years that I feel like people don't really understand the struggles that he has. And they're expecting him to meet expectations um, that he's not always capable of 
meeting without some scaffolding and support or explicit teaching. Um, so, you know, he, he was always the kid who comes home and has forgotten his, uh, to write down the exact number of, uh, the exact numbers on the math sheet he was supposed to do. He was supposed to do the odd numbers. He did them all or he did the homework and he leaves it on the counter and he forgets to bring it. Um, you know, he writes things in the agenda in the wrong week. Um, so, you know, it, it really, a lot of that is, uh, stuff that happens in the part of the, the frontal cortex of the brain. And, you know, for him, that's an under funk under, uh, it's not as an active area as it needs to be. And, uh, he, he just needs a lot of support. So, it, you know, this, this just kind of, this area in particular rings true with me because it's been an area that we've, uh, struggled with in our house quite a bit. So, uh, you know, and I just get frustrated sometimes because I feel like my son has not always been with teachers that completely understand the struggle that he has. And I want to make sure that we have a compassionate uh, approach to how we teach and that we understand the struggles of each of our individual kids. So um, I'm not doing a great job here on the spot. No, I, th I think I quite, quite, I think you are, and I think you do it from the heart. And I think that's important that people hear that that, that executive functioning is a vital, um, vital something that needs to be taught in a vital manner. I guess is the best way to put it. It's essential. Um, Superintendent so. Lynch, I, I will tell you, I also have a son with a diagnosed executive functioning, and Middleborough Public Schools did a wonderful <laughs> job with him. <laughs> Yeah. But I guess I would turn it back over to the chair so you can uh, take questions, Mr. Chair. Certainly. Does anyone have any questions for the elementary? Teresa, go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, fantastic presentation for all three of you. And I love that you do this great collaboration together. Of course, it's important for our little kindergartners to start strong and then you know continue forward which wherever they land at HBB or MKG. Um, I love the SEL piece um, mostly, but I'm curious, do you follow any type of PBIS or is there any P PD involved in just some positive behavioral interventions that um, is that sort of encompassing in SEL or is there something specifically differentiated on that? Can I, can I jump in on that one? I, you know, to me, PBIS is creating a positive culture in the school, right? So like at the Berkland school, it's all about the Berkland's best. That's our setting the expectation. This is what we want kids to do. We reward kids when we catch them meeting the Berkland's best. We give them Berkland's best tickets. I know MKG and Mac, they do the same exact thing. Um, and then we use right now the Purposeful People program to teach kids how to meet those expectations. I think mindfulness is just an added layer of teaching kids to control themselves a little bit more. And we talk about kids, you know, the more kids are using devices and phones and all these things, they have a hard time focusing. So minimally, mindfulness is helping kids stay a little bit more grounded and focused. Um, it, it helps kids be more present, more aware of their surroundings, more aware of the peers around them. So it's a piece of PBIS. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I see it anyway. And I really feel like it's the last piece that we've needed to add here. Um, Thank you. Rich, go right ahead. Sure, thanks all for the presentations. Uh, it's always really great to see that we're so purposeful in what we're doing um, about the future. And uh, just a couple questions, um, uh, I think actually, Let's see. No, some of them are specific. Um, so I'll just start with um, with Mr. Gobiel. Um, thank you very much again for the presentation. Um, I think uh, you would probably agree that the survey results were actually very positive. And um, I, I took a look at the specific results and I wondered, there was one that stood out. Um, I, I know there was some data flipped around in there and, and that made sense. But I wondered if you could uh, could talk about the one that came in that just said, um, I, I feel like I'll have a voice in decision making going forward. And it it was a little lower than we might like, but still not bad, I think. Um, I just wondered if you could maybe talk about that and guess at maybe where that's coming from. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> it it kind of struck me as well, Mr. Oakley, and, and, and both both the staff and the family survey, I think it was um, pretty similar. 
I, I do believe that what happened was a um, couple things. One was um, that just we 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 were so reactive to the guidelines that were given to us from CDC and DESE and trying to figure out like how things are going to happen for this year as far as you know three feet of space and six feet of space and and we you know we were in mid September trying to figure out you know still like what what, what were the classrooms going to look like so I I did definitely feel like uh, both both um, staff and families felt like they they were being kind of told told what to do and then it was it was also really complicated with our 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 union our teachers union the MEA and and trying to figure out you know their 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 part in this as well so I just feel like this that that. That's that's what I garnered from this information the, from the data was that um, people felt like they were just being told and, and honest to, to honestly we all I think we all felt the same way like we you know we were waiting for guidelines to come out and to to tell us what what we can and, and can't do so I think that was part of it. Sure, thank you very much, and, and that makes perfect sense. I, I think you're right. I think everyone in in the whole world probably felt that way. Um, and Mr. Chair, if it's okay, just one, one more quick question uh, that I think applies to actually all the presentations. So whoever wants to jump in, um, I just wondered if you could talk about what what a, what an SEL screener is and what the role of that person is or, or program for that matter. A universal screener, it's, it's a document that's used to, um, we've used one for a couple of years and um, <coughs> they're out there. Um, you know, you can use them for, there's different purposes for them. Um, and it's a universal screener that they're developed and where it's to identify students in need for, for different areas. Um, you know, sometimes you can purchase them. Um, there's some that are free to identify students in need or students that require um, different services uh, with counseling. Um, sometimes even if it's something that we think it's something we can't handle or it's a trauma based that it's something that's outside of the school realm. It also gives us an avenue to contact families and to, you know, make families aware of situations. And we also have, you know, Meg Cork that we work closely with as well um, with her grant um, and with providing counseling for our kids outside of school. Great. Thank you very much. Other questions? Mr. Chair, if there are no more questions, we can move on to Mrs. Latunda and the Nichols Middle School and, and excuse our elementary principals and thank them for their presentations. And uh, thanks for showing up, folks. And um, welcome to Mrs. Latunda. I believe she'll be up on the stage in a moment. There you are. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Lynch, school committee chair and school committee, and all of our community members out there in Middleborough. Thanks for joining us tonight. I am proud and happy to be presenting our school improvement plan for Nichols Middle School for the next year, 2021, 2022. It's hard to believe we're at the end of our first year um, or my first year here at Nichols Middle School. I've been fortunate to work with a very strong committee this year. And as you can see, our committee members are listed on the cover page. Mrs. Brienne Kessamian, uh, Mrs. Paula Lazan, our two wonderful parents who had a lot of insight as we met each month and gave some great input. Mrs. Kate Hitu is our speech and language teacher. Mrs. Beth Evans, one of our eighth grade English teachers. Mrs. Amy Anderson, our math teacher and co-chair, and as well as myself. And we've had a great team and everyone's input was validated and very much appreciated as we work to figure out what our goals would be for Nichols Middle School for the next coming year. Next slide, please. So this year at the Nichols Middle School, we have four goals and they are an umbrella view of what we need to do. So if you think of these four areas under each goal, each goal we have about 11 action steps, give or take. So goal one, I have 11 action steps. Goal two, we have six action steps. Goal three, we have 13 action steps. And goal four, there are five action steps that we'll take. But we always begin with Improving best teaching practices and instructional routines to support student learning, engagement, and achievement. And then our big goal, as you heard all night from everybody else, is embed social emotional learning strategies and best practices into all of Nichols Middle School students' academic and school-wide experiences throughout the school year. And also to enhance professional learning community practices 
that celebrates successes, identifies areas of growth, and strives to continually improve practices through positive relationships and a shared growth mindset. And finally, to maintain safe facilities that fosters a positive learning environment in alignment with 21st century teaching and learning. And the facilities goal is new to our plan this year. Goals one, two, and three are similar to last year, but reworked with this um, school council. Next slide. So goal one is really all encompassing of the work we need to do at Nichols Middle School. We have a lot of great things going on at Nichols Middle School, but as the new principal to this school, I feel like the goal is to streamline all of our practices and our expectations. So we're looking to implement evidence-based inclusive practices. We call that tier one to support all learners. And I'll explain that in a minute. And also to identify what tier two targeted supports look like. And then we want to explore successful middle school response to intervention models in other districts. At the middle school, since our students rotate between different content areas, RTI, differentiation or small group instruction looks different and sometimes tends to go away a little bit. And it's not as focused as you might notice at the elementary level. So I'm really working with other principals in area towns to look at what they are doing to make that happen in their schools and try to figure out what is the best model that would fit best with our goals and initiatives here at Nichols Middle School. And then we also want to develop a schedule for administration of unit assessments and our common benchmark assessments in core academic areas. And then we also want to continue to train our staff member who is Natalie LaParia to um, continue her training in the Leslie literacy model, which also piggybacks on our elementary schools. So Natalie LaPeria is one of our English teachers in seventh grade, and she did a lot of training this year, to, and she's working her way through being a Leslie literacy coach. And next year, her goal is to do a lot of professional development with our staff. We'll start with our ELA department, but then we will branch out where applicable to all of the departments. So when you look at um, the overall school, I want you to think of a triangle. And at the base of the triangle, we call that tier one. And research suggests that tier one is where 80% of your school population typically are in, where, in delivery of instruction. And then tier two are for those students who might need additional support or targeted instruction strategies that might be a little different than the typical student performing at grade level. And then tier three are for those students might be five to 10%, well, actually three to 5% of your school population that need more targeted, um, explicit instructions, instructional strategies different from um, the general ed classroom. So when we look at that, I look at what does that look like at Nichols Middle School? What do those three areas look like here? And how does that present itself in the classrooms? And my goal is to take all these strategies and all the great things that are already going on at Nichols Middle School and pull them together so we all have the same common understanding and expectations of what best teaching practices should look like, how to implement response to intervention and differentiated instruction or small group instruction. And that work will help us um, with the Leslie program by doing Reader's Writer's Workshop at the middle school level, which will look different than at the elementary level. And we are also looking at uh, our common assessments and having data to look at where students are, where their strengths and weaknesses are, and also being reflective of our own teachers' practices of where their strengths and weaknesses are as well. So this is all encompassing of what we need to do here at Nichols Middle School. There's a lot of great things already going on, and I just would like to streamline it so we all have a common understanding so we can move forward together as a team. Next slide. Thank you. Goal two is focusing on our social emotional learning across all settings. And we wanna to begin to identify and implement expected social emotional learning practices into our daily and weekly routines to support all learners. And that's really talking about what are the expectations throughout the entire school? What does it look like in the hallway? What do we expect our students to do? How are they supposed to act and behave if they're in the hallway or in the cafeteria? or in the auditorium during a presentation. 
does everyone have a common understanding and follow through um, of what those expectations are so students know what the expectation is wherever they go. And it really is about students when they enter into a different setting, they have to shift their mindset of, okay, I have a new teacher, this teacher allows me to do this in this classroom, but in this classroom, I'm not allowed to do that. And then when I'm in the cafeteria, I have to behave this way. And then when I'm in the hallway, I have to behave this way. And a lot of these skills are already embedded because they are middle school students. But at the same token, we sometimes forget that our students need practice and need modeling and reinforcement of what those expectations are. And we, when we're in middle school, we are adolescents and you know, they become more impulsive at times because their bodies are changing. Um, and sometimes they need frequent reminders just like our elementary students. They're very capable um, young adults, but sometimes they need that, the continuation of practice modeling and routines so they know what the expectations are. And we need to model that for them. I think that's the other piece. I think we expect students to know what we expect. And sometimes we're not as clear as we could be about those expectations. So that's an area I'd like to focus on as a school and maybe with a committee. And I'd also like to administer some bi-monthly student surveys and maybe even monthly and analyze and act on their input as applicable. So basically, how are students doing? What are, the, what are their interests? What are their concerns? What are their likes? Um, and then kind of look at their data and their feedback. And we can look at it by grade level, we can look at it by team, um, we can look at it as a whole school, and then as a committee within the school, look at what the needs are from our students' perspective. They're young adults and they do have a voice. And um, it's interesting to have them email me or share their thoughts and ideas, and I think it's valuable input as well. Um, and then we just talked about this, I think, with. Um, Mr. Thompson and Mrs. White about the screening tool. Um, I've been working with Carolyn Lyons in my guidance department about looking at what type of um, screening tool will work best for the middle school students. And then our guidance department has been, they are a wonderful team and they send out surveys to their students or just questionnaires or even just have an access point for students to reach out to them when they need support at any time. Um, so we'll continue with those things, but we just wanna build upon what we already have. And then we also want to reinstate the after-school enrichment programs for students such as Tiger Trails and start a homework health club. Currently, we were just, today was our last day in our um, extra help for students who needed a little extra support in some content areas, and it has gone very well. And our teachers felt like this would be a great addition next year is have a um, homework help in addition to the Tiger Trails, which tends to be more of an enrichment programs for our students. So we'd like to um, explore those options for our school next year. Next slide, please. So we too are also looking at our professional learning community practices and looking at areas of growth and what we need to improve upon in building positive relationships um, with each other and with students. And we wanna create a committee to analyze behavioral data on a monthly or bi-monthly basis to, to determine trends and areas of needing improvement. Um, historically, I know this, you know, for those who have been around town and lived in Middleborough for a while, um, you know, we do look at what discipline looks like in our schools and, you know, is there something we can be doing better or doing differently to support our students in a different way to avoid some of the discipline that may happen. But also, it really comes down to building relationships, staff building relationships with each other, building relationships with students, and having those restorative justice practices um, with a student around a situation. Because I say, every time we talk to a student, they might have made a bad choice, it's a moment in time. And the question is, okay, how can we recover? What did we learn and how can we move on? And how can we still be a you know productive citizen in, in the classroom and in my school um, and just start over? So um, we all have bumps in the road, I tell our students. and. The important thing is to you know pick yourself up and start over and learn from your mistakes and try to try to do better um and so we also want to create a gender support plan for nichols middle school and it's just a process our students go through different things at adolescent level here at the middle school i'm sure it carries over at the high school as well and we also want to look into having some type of family information on nights around these air around these topics that can be very sensitive um, to our students and to families. 
So those are a few other areas we'd like to um, address next year. Next slide, please. Thank you. And also we have a beautiful school here at Nichols Middle School and we're very fortunate that it's very well maintained and we'd like to keep up with the aesthetics of our school. I think we're in the 21st year or 20th year of this building being open and we do receive many, many compliments of how well this school has been maintained over the years and continues to be maintained. So we also wanna maintain the, uh, the structural integrity of our building and create an outdoor classroom space. Uh, we do have a patio outside the cafeteria area, but we also have other areas around the back of the building. We'd love to build some type of out, outdoor um, picnic table learning classroom space for our students. Um, not sure that that space will be developed next year, but it, a plan could begin and thinking about how to go about that. And then a big ticket item is um, eventually to repave Tiger Drive in the parking lot and the, oh, there's a typo there, and the bus loop. Um, our driveway has not been done since the school has opened. And if you've been up and down our driveway, you will see that there are lots of potholes, but there, there are some uh, trucks going up and down our driveway that are working in the water tower at this time. So, um, but that's just a, a future goal. Not sure when that might happen, but we have to start somewhere. So we have a lot of things going on. Um, a lot of, uh, a great direction we're heading in. Um, and here's a little bit of feedback. I had a lot of great survey results. It was hard to narrow down just a few items to share with you. Um, we had 185 family, uh, family responses. And we do have 745 students thereabouts. And we had 503 responses from students. And then we had 41 responses from staff. Um, and really, there was we, the majority of our feedback was positive and um, very happy with the structure of how we did virtual learning and how we did our hybrid model here at Nichols Middle School. And many people felt very safe with our return to school plans and that many people felt that our school and our environment was in a good place for our students and families. And the parent guardians felt that they were respected when they communicated with the Nichols Middle School faculty and staff. And then, um, or when they attend any school sponsored events, which we didn't have many school sponsored events this year other than sports and a few other things at the end of the year, but 91% agree or strongly agreed. And then we did have mixed reviews on virtual parent teacher conferences. I almost feel like it was about 70 or 65, 70% really liked the virtual conferences. Um, and then there were some families that preferred the in-person. So that's something we'll talk about next year is maybe having one night that could be virtual conferences and one night being in-person conferences because a lot of families liked having the virtual conference because they did not need to get daycare um, and they could just pop on their phone if they were at work and didn't have to arrange and run from one place to another and it was very convenient for them. And um, they did see a lot of our families because of that, much like our school committee meetings, we have a lot of people attending, which is wonderful. And then um, online learning, um, a lot of people said it worked really well for them and the students said 75% agree or strongly agree and with the teachers it was 77%, uh, which I thought was pretty good overall because it was a huge learning curve for everyone. And we have a lot of tech savvy staff in our building who've been wonderful helping out their colleagues. Um, it's been a team effort all year. Um, and then our clear academic expectations, students, it was a question to students about, do they feel like their teachers are clear with um, what the expectations are and 90% agree or strongly agree. And then the question was about feeling respected when talking to teachers and staff and 85% um, agreed or strongly agreed. An area that we'd like to focus on that came up in um, the surveys was that both faculty and students expressed concern about students' ability to manage emotions and their ability to problem solve situations effectively, which really led us to that continuous uh, development of helping our students manage themselves, manage their decisions and relationships, and um, which all ties under the umbrella of social emotional learning. So um, this is typical usually at Nichols, you know, at middle school level for students. They're having a hard time. Sometimes they're figuring out where they fit in and who their friends are and what group they should be in. And, and it, it truly is in the middle of, you know, 
move into being an adult and um, understanding adolescence and bodies changing and all of the above. So uh, our job is to you know help our students navigate that in this time in their lives and help them be su successful and have some coping skills and strategies to help them along the way. So that's our plan in a nutshell, but there's a lot more to it than that. And I'd be happy to entertain questions before or after Mr. Brannigan's presentation. Thank you, Mrs. Latenda. Uh, to, to Rich Young, I, I give it to you, to questions for uh, for Heidi Latenda and the Nichols Middle School School Improvement Plan. So, Teresa, I saw your hand up, so go right ahead. Thank you, and thank you, Mrs. Latenda. Um, as you come on your first year here, <laughs> finishing off, you've done a great job. Um, I you. certainly appreciate that. Um, curious, so we just listened to Mr. Thompson and Mrs. White, and we, they talked about their you know, school stores and those types of things. And I know that as these kiddos get older and they kind of leave that behind, it's maybe something that isn't as exciting to them. But my my thinking is, and I'm just sort of curious and thinking out loud a little bit, but any thoughts on continued just positive reinforcement and what that might look like at the middle school level? Yes, we actually have tiger stripes and students love getting the tiger stripes. So teachers can nominate students at any time to earn a tiger stripe for demonstrating respect, friendship, responsibility, um, good citizenships. Um, so students, teachers fill out a form, I sign it, write a note on it as well, and then we announce them over the intercom, they come down and get their tiger stripe wristband. I purchased um, postcards this year, uh, Nichols Middle School postcards, and we challenge the teachers to send out postcards and little positive notes of reinforcement or just hello to students in the mail, snail mail, because who doesn't like good mail, a positive mail, <laughs> opposed to bills or something else. And then we also have the um, Aurora Awards that are monthly awards that students earn. Um, so those go out and they get their bumper stickers to go with it with a certificate. And then we also have been handing out honor roll and high honor roll certificates this year for each term. So we have a lot of those things in place and the goal on the plan is to continue with those. And we're open to new ideas and suggestions. Thank you. You're welcome. Rich Hopley, go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and um, thank you very much, Mrs. Latender, for the presentation. Uh, I, I had a question for you. I'm very curious about uh, Lexia and um, what type of data does it track? And, um, uh, and, and what does that look like uh, in terms of how you use it for rolling out these plans? So this year was just a pilot. And then when we started it, then we had to switch our gears over to a full implementation model <laughs> and then and then MCAS. So we're just finished our MCAS. But really, Lexia is a, a proven reading based program that helps close the achievement gap for students if they really work on meeting their targeted minutes. So it's differentiated as students work through it. So there's a little placement test at the very beginning of it. So students follow the placement test as a comprehension, there's a word study, and I think the other one is grammar. So the placement test um, tracks where students are and their abilities based on their responses and their reading. And then it places them on a track of, depending on their level, it could be higher, it could be on grade level, might be a little behind. And that might differentiate between those three categories that I mentioned. So students, you know, we can look at that data and see individual reports on where students are at. And then teachers can use that information, say, okay, these students are struggling in these areas. How can I change my instruction or work with this small group of students to tackle that area that they need improvement on? Or these students are doing very well, I need to challenge them and give them something else. And it also will cross over into other content areas because we can look at where students' reading abilities are and reading levels are at so that with their reading articles in social studies, then we can look at differentiated articles that have same content, but might be at a different reading level. So all students have equal access to the content so they can um, better participate and understand the same thing that everyone else is doing. It's tricky because at the middle school level, you don't want something that looks immature in elementary, but you want it to be something that students can access and feel comfortable accessing at their level. So. There's a lot of great pieces to, to Lexia. We haven't been able to dive into it as deep as we'd like to. My goal is to do some more training either over the summer and part of our PD days next year and do a full rollout. So um, we're just 
touching the iceberg on that, but it's a wonderful program. There's a lot of benefits because it will tie right into us looking at another piece of common assessments and data across the entire grade and across the entire school, because right now we don't have that. At the elementary schools, they have Star 360 at both schools, and they can look at data across all five grades, and we don't have systems like that in place here at Nichols Middle School and yet, but the Lexi will, will begin that step in that process for us to be able to look at student data and help uh, move our students forward. But that's also a learning process for our staff. So uh, that will be part of our, our professional development as well. Excellent, thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, if it's okay, I just had one related question uh, sure. to that. Um, I, I was, I, I liked, a lot of the things you talked about, and, and to, to their credit, uh, these were parts of the other plans that we, we listened to already. Um, the social and race, racial justice plan, the gender support plan, I mean, these things sound amazing. Um, but the one thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, you mentioned a, a behavioral um, committee, um, uh, or um, I forget what the words were you used, for, but um, there was a mention of behavioral data and I'm sure this is probably second nature to educators and, and people that are in and around the school system, uh, but I'm not. And so I'm curious, um, how, do, how does behavioral, how is behavioral data kept? Um, and, and how do you use that uh, for, for the purposes of a committee like this? Well, with my guidance team and with the admin team, um, what we'd like to do is look at trends. So are there certain, um, situations of behaviors happening mostly in the cafeteria or on the buses or in the hallways or in particular areas of the school and or with particular teachers or you know what is going on in those settings that we need to address to make things better are we targeting certain students for some reason so you know our goal is to really look at the broad spectrum of you know what's happening and why are things happening so we can improve and turn those things around and how can we best support all of our students and our teachers um, to make better sound decisions in supporting our students. You know, when students misbehave or make a poor choice, you know, you can get in a power struggle with students if you're, if you're not sure how, how to handle it or something catch you off guard. And we all have good days and bad days, students and adults. So the goal is really to look at um, what's working, what's not working, and what are the areas we need to improve upon and how can we look at that information and make um, better decisions for our, our school and our students. And that's what it all comes down to. What works best for our students and how can we best support them to be successful? Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and throughout your whole presentation, all the presentations we've seen, I love the you know, evidence-based, um, data-based decisions. Um, so thank you for, for being part of that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Other questions? Um, Heidi, I just do want to point out that somebody made a comment um, uh, which is related to you asking for uh, comments. Uh, <laughs> they wondered if uh, positive reinforcement could be some temporary increased freedoms. Uh, for example, ice cream social for honors, freedom to go to other spaces in the school, library, uh, during free time, et cetera, in addition to uh, simple recognitions. The, we're always open to those ideas and we have to be careful with ice cream, but <laughs> we could make those things happen. Uh, and we hope to do a lot more of those things with having more opportunities next year and not being under COVID time. So thank you, Desiree, for that information. I appreciate it. That's the fun stuff we like to do. Mr. Chair, if there's nothing else for Mrs. Latender, we can excuse Mrs. Latender. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Heidi. And then we'll thank move you. on to uh, Mr. Brannigan. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. And um, first, I just want to thank everybody for being a part of our um, celebrations over the weekend. So it was great to see so many of you and just uh, thank you on behalf of the school community for being a part of it. So um, it really meant a lot to have um, so many of you there. Um, it's really with great um, pride to be able to share with you our school improvement plan and um, really just a fabulous group of members of our council um, and the list is there from Heather Montross, who served as our chair, um, Elizabeth Cheng Bush, Sam Desharnas as um, one of our teacher reps, Amory Jacobson, Brian Kesteman, um, Diane Russo, Joanne Salamone, Bonnie Soul, um, Crystal White. And I wanted to point out that we had two really dynamic students who sat on our council this year, Julie Malloy, who's in the 11th grade, and Lucy Tech, Sarah in grade nine. So 
um, just really a, a wonderful group of people. And really, I think our plan is quite comprehensive um, because of, of their input and their vision. So, um, so I'd love to share with you our goals. I think when you look at a high school, that the complexity of a school improvement plan becomes um, really much more significant because there are so many variables at a high school that needs to be considered. And you'll notice the fact that our council put together 11 goals. Um, and I think what's important to note is you'll notice goal number 11 is in red and it says the MHS reboot, the COVID-19 response plan. Um, in our school improvement plan, we had that identified as its own goal, but I think it's important for the um, school committee to, to know is the fact that that really became our umbrella, that we really went into this plan as really a, um, a, really a response plan to some degree of really what we've experienced this year with COVID-19. Um, from an academic standpoint, from a social emotional standpoint, um, really from a cultural standpoint of really how do we ensure the fact that as we are beginning a new school year in the fall, um, which I think all of us are hoping is, is really a very different school year ahead. Um, it was important the fact that every decision we were making for our goals really had some tenants of really our reboot. So as you move to um, the slides, it's gonna be really an overarching piece of really where I combined a lot of these goals together to give you some really, uh, um, really the big ticket items of really what we're hoping to do. So really in our MHS reboot, the COVID-19 response, it's really about um, our plan is a direct relation to the relaunching of the high school in the fall. Um, it's a creation of a formal integration pro, um, plan for students returning in the fall. And this really looks at the academic um, aspects of our work. Um, everything from um, really the re-engagement of students in, in um, full-time learning. And we know the fact that as, as the high school transition back to in, in mid-May, um, we noticed the fact that stamina was an issue and really just the ability for students to really uh, know that it's five days a week, every day in person. And so really looking at that aspect of really that academic standpoint, but also the social emotional piece. And you'll see throughout our plan is that um, social emotional learning and response is woven through really all the tenants of our plan this year. It's also an engagement piece as well. I mean, how do we get our students to become re-engaged in school again um, into the level that we want them to be? Really looking at a curriculum response and alignment in all content areas. We have been working on this um, throughout the entire year of really taking um, from the spring of last year um, into the school year as well of the constant um, activity of looking at the curriculum to make sure where does it need to be tweaked? What does our pacing need to look like to ensure the fact that we're able to catch students where potentially they might've missed something. Um, and you'll see the third one is really creating a plan to address possible equity issues for some students. And really the term in here is a personalized action plan. Um, to close potential gaps for learning and meeting graduation requirements. What we have been working on and what was created this fall is what is called an academic support team. It's very it's, um, similar to our child study team, but only this particular team in an academic standpoint, their total charge is to really be looking at students from an academic standpoint. Are they making it in all their classes? Are they passing? And we know that sometimes a student who may be presented in an academic support team is gonna be potentially a same student pretend, um, shared in a child study team. Um, so this personalized action plan is really in, in many ways a graduation plan. So if we have students that are, are really have found that as this year comes to a close, that there is some real um, challenge for them in potentially being a retained student because they have not been able to meet the, the credit need to be able to move to the next grade. It would allow for us to be able to work with them, with their school counselor, um, to be able to create these personalized action plans for them. And the idea of it is, is to make sure how can we ensure that we can get these students back on track again to um, be able to graduate in the year that they're intended to do. Really looking at our social, emotional and trauma informed work with for all stakeholders, not only our students, but also our staff. Um, I think that there's so many times that there's a focus on students, which that really needs to be the, the paramount to focus 
But I think it's also important, especially at the high school level, is to really place a focus as well on, on the staff as well from their own social emotional growth and need as well. And then really, I just think the lifeblood of any high school is really the student life and activities reboot. Um, really looking at how do you re-engage the arts again? How do you engage things like student council and activities and programs and all of that? Um, and that's all part of this response plan. Um, Sean, if you would please, to the next slide. This next slide really combines um, three of our goals, which is leveling curriculum and assessment. And, and you'll notice as a, as a school committee that these are goals that we have every year. Um, and I, I think as we as a school council every year when we do our assessment, um, it really is something that we deeply believe needs to be maintained because it, every year it is really living documents. It's really what are we doing with our leveling? What are we seeing in our curriculum and our assessment? One of the things for this upcoming year is really redefining our leveling practices. And one of the things that we had to do out of necessity this year um, was that we had to combine our college preparatory and our honors program at all levels where we could do it. Um, where basically we were teaching students at the college preparatory level as well as the honors level in the same class. And it was really done through a differentiated learning approach. And what we found was, was the fact that we, we really had in many areas of the building, especially in ninth grade, um, we had a lot of positive reactions and responses to that environment. And one of the things that we made a decision as, as a council, but also really in supported by the faculty, was really not to really go down the road and say, well, because we did it out of necessity, that it dictates that we should keep doing it. But it really allows for us to be able to really take a lot of the data that we will have at the end of this year and begin to really look at actually um, what could leveling practices look like moving forward. Is it something from a philosophical standpoint and an educational standpoint that really works? So something we did out of necessity yielded some positive responses and results. So now do we look at this as really in a deeper lens to say, is this something we should be doing moving forward? It's also to build from that, it's really looking at our ninth graders coming in. Um, really looking at this particular group, looking at how we can engage them in our freshman academy, and really looking at the, um, the impact on the combined levels in grade nine. So as we're looking at this year's data, um, next year we are not doing that as an approach, and really be able to do a comparison of really looking at what we did out of necessity this year, to really the much more organic college preparatory class, honors level class, and then be able to make a move as we see um, if deemed appropriate. You'll also notice the constant renewal of our curriculum work, um, the relevance work of really looking at what we're doing in our curriculum and really making sure the fact that all of it from throughout all of our content areas that what we are engaging our students with is relevant to where they are now. Um, also, the potential learning gaps, and I really like to use the word learning gap, it's really more of actually looking at really the bridges between grade to grade. So we're looking at a student going from Algebra 1 to Geometry, a student going from English 1 to, to English 2. It's really making sure the fact that we have those bridges in place to make sure that we're not missing any parts. Also a redesign of the electives program. Now that we're in the new building, it really has been a charge for our school is to really take a good look at really what we are teaching in our electives. Um, is it time to maybe hang up some of them and start really some new ones? And that is gonna be um, a charge for this year. And then also um, looking at the culture, the culture engagement of online learning assessment. As you know, at the high school level, as it's been all over the district, is that online learning has been a major component of our work. And that at the high school level in particular, you'll note the fact that we had created our online learning lab. So now it's again taking the same construct and saying what worked and what didn't, but also knowing the fact that there was a lot of things that came out of this experience this year that really may yield some open opportunities for our students as we continue with um, engaging students in how to learn from an online world. Looking at our midterms and final exam protocols um, and really looking at really what's the rationale for continuing with them. Um, and then lastly, I want this goal to be noted because this really came from our student reps on the committee, um, is really looking at an MCAS and PST, PSAT response plan um, in regard to COVID-19. That once all of our data points come in from our MCAS scores this year is really how then do we respond to that? Um, and I really thought it was a compelling um, goal that we as a council really um, bid into based upon the student engagement of the committee. Um, Sean, please. Thank you. The next slide. 
And this one really looks at um, now that we're in the new building and really the beginnings of really us looking at rethinking teaching and learning and also our accreditation. Um, you're going to notice the fact that italicized on the slide is the Middlebar High School vision of a graduate. Um, this is work that we began this fall. Um, there's a team here at the high school as well as Dr. Gates um, who have been part of a training that we spent with NIASC actually um, going through um, really the found fundamentals of how to create a vision of the graduate. It's important to note that albeit that the vision of the graduate is the kind of a high school initiative, that it really becomes a district-wide lens. So it's really taking a, a child coming in at kindergarten and what is that vision of that graduate? And as that, as that child moves through grade to grade and school to school, by the time they reach us in the ninth grade, the fact that a lot of the fundamentals of really, or the vision of what we want as a graduate um, in Middleborough has been really celebrated in the first eight, nine years of that student's educational journey. And the goal is, is to be able to really begin to launch the vision of the graduate in the upcoming year. And also our call to action and shared beliefs as a high school. This is work, to be quite candid, was started in 2020, um, actually right before we closed. Um, and it's really about bringing it all back again. And it really becomes a fundamental piece of really what the um, capabilities are of this building and how we as a faculty are ensuring um, teaching and learning that is complementary to a 21st century state-of-the-art high school. You're also gonna notice the content strategic plans. Um, as if for members of the committee who have um, seen uh, the work from the high school, you note our accountability plans. And now we're going from a year to year plan to really a long range plan. And so the content areas have begun their work of really looking at a three year plan. And they, the goal is to launch them this coming fall um, that would really see in the vision planning of really where do we see um, every content area from the content areas to counseling, to our futures program. Um, it is really all facets of our school community as really what are our goals to be reached in the next three years. Also, just with our accreditation, we have our final um, special progress report due in September. I will say the fact that the one ticket item on it is the formal completion of the high school project. And I'm, I am anticipating that once we submit this final progress report, um, that the high school will come off warning, um, which I'm quite excited by. And then lastly, it's just preparing our accreditation, which has been now moved to 2025, but it will begin this upcoming year in the preparation. Sean, please. Um, this one is a major aspect of our work for the upcoming year of transition um, counseling and social emotional learning. Um, one of the big items is really the beginning of the transition from our ACE program, which is known as our alternative classroom environment or what has been known as our in-school suspension. And really the beginnings of a change from that kind of a, a, an environment to really what we call a transition program. Um, and that what we have noticed over the last many years is that the construct of an in-school suspension room and program has really not really been needed. Um, and because of really just a more of a progressive discipline model that has been really cultivated here. And so really moving this transition program to really allowing for students who are coming back from a hospitalization, a student who may just need a space, um, it would really be kind of taking on a very different look to it as well. And the nice part is, is that this location of the space is directly off the school counseling department in the new building. Um, also our road to college, our road to future plan, excuse me. And what it's really looking at is three tenants. It's looking at our career readiness programming. It's looking um, at really our trades and making sure the fact that we're engaging students who have really no intention of going on to maybe a college or university. But we also have the responsibility to make sure the fact that we're giving them all that they need in regards to potentially going into a pathway of more of a trade or certificate program. And then also a major initiative for us that we're really excited by is really looking at our first generation students, um, looking at our students who potentially um, could be um, um, students who would be the very first one in their family to go to college. It could be students um, who are part of our EL program um, and population who they would be really a very first generation to move on to a college university. And then really what kind of programming could we be doing as well? Um, there was actually a meeting today that I had with one of the deans from Bridgewater um, uh, in regards to exactly this topic, first generation students. Um, really looking at creation of social emotional protocols uh, to address mental health impacts. 
Um, this is, I think you've seen uh, through every one of the presentations tonight, but I think at the high school in particular, it is a paramount um, goal for us um, because if we don't have a system in place of really looking at how we can support students in the transition back, um, nothing else we're trying to do is going to be found met with success. And then lastly, just really looking at updating all of our protocols with transition. Um, you'll see the class of 2024, and I put them in here because we've had a lot of conversation about this year's ninth grade, and how can we make sure the fact that they have um, really in many ways um, a, a celebration of really their start of high school, because their start of high school was very different than maybe what their counterparts have had um, before them. But also looking at this year's ninth grade coming in, as well as looking at the incoming, the rising eighth grade, is we're seeing the trends and working with Heidi, um, to see really how can we be navigating and also being able to calibrate um, do we need to address things in a little bit different way based upon really what Heidi has seen coming in as the rising eighth graders at the Nichols. Sean, thank you. These two particular goals for us are, are just important um, in many ways placeholders. You know the fact that it is a goal for the high school that we will have a new high school schedule. Um, it is really in the upcoming year is to begin to do a status report of really reinvigorating the timeline um, and really coming up with really, well, what is feasible and what is it going to look like? Um, and that's going to be done in earnest this fall. But one of the things that I think is important is really looking at aspects of our schedule or, or pending schedule. Um, we had talked about a senior experience. What could that second semester look like for our seniors? Um, the advisory block, as well as really a structural impact. Um, you're looking at really what we created in, in 2018, 2019, and we're looking now at potentially, is, is that something that is really working for us now that we're in the space of the new building? And is it something we need to go back and look at it again with a keen eye to make sure the fact that it's really what we want? And then lastly, it's beginning the process of looking at graduation requirements as well as advanced placement protocols. And what I mean by that is, is that we run 18 advanced placement courses every year, and we try to run all 18. And that what we're finding is, is the fact that one of the things we need to maybe looking at is do you offer AP programs each, every other year? So it may be, um, you may offer AP US history on the odd years and you would offer AP US history or world history or European history, excuse me, in the even years. So it's really just looking at really how do we enhance and how do we make sure the fact that we're able to get our students everything that they possibly need, um, complementing a new schedule as we move forward. And lastly, just with the new school where every day we're learning something that we didn't know because you don't know what you don't know every day. And so one of the things we're looking to do is that it would be a brand new program of studies, obviously, as we're launching next fall. Um, our handbook, uh, Mr. Dizel has been working on that. We know that a survey went out to our school community looking for input on really the um, updating of the upcoming handbook and really looking at a transition plan. How are we transitioning into the new year? Because especially if the high school is able to function um, at full capacity in regards to um, without all of the protocols we have in place. And you'll notice the sustainability plan. Um, one of the things we will be doing at the end of the school year is really looking at all of the ways that this building functioned and really what do we need to be doing to ensure as we go into the new school year um, is really how do we manage all the spaces in this building that we needed to kind of do experiments with and see how the students navigated that. And Sean, the next goal, please. And really our last goal, but it really I think speaks volumes to really the, the greater scope of our plan is really our cultural proficiency plan. And I think as a committee, as a school council, we're really quite proud of this. Um, it's really looking at a comprehensive plan um, for our English language learners to address the academic, social, emotional transition need, transitional needs of our students. We know that at the high school level, this is a um, growing population. And it's really how are we responding to that and how are we preparing them for be students who would be potentially a first generation student off to college? Um, what are we doing to make sure we're getting them there? And then also the intentional infusion of cultural proficiency into all classroom curriculum throughout the high school. You know, um, Principal White had made a comment about really looking at um, that all students can see themselves in what they're learning. And it's really that is really an initiative that that's happening all over the place, including the high school. 
um, enhancement of our restorative justice protocols at the high school. It has been something that has been done in, in, in kind of pieces and in certain circumstances. And it's really about now enhancing that with the work of Mr. Dizel and Mrs. Luco. And you'll notice actually a professional learning plan. And this is something that um, we're really quite proud of is the beginnings of really looking at how do we create a professional learning plan, looking at equity, implicit bias, and racial justice within all of our staff. We have an incredibly vibrant um, group of faculty members who are really um, have done a lot of work looking at social justice in many different areas of school community. And I think this really just will lend itself to really um, a greater scope of a lens of really what we are doing as a school. And then lastly, we've been very fortunate to have a really wonderful um, connection and partnership with the Anti-Defamation League that was started two years ago. And really just the, the ability to be able to enhance that further, not only with our students, but also with our staff as well. Um, and we're, we've just begun a little bit of a conversation as well with um, potential at an entry point with doing some partnership work with Bridgewater State University as well. So, um, and, um, and Sean, I, I believe that is it. And I'd be very happy to take any um, questions or comments um, as well. So thank you for, for letting me share. So Paul, thank you very much. Um, I do want to point out one thing, Paul, that's important. In, uh, so the NASDAQ report, um, we are on warning, but we are solely on warning because of the physical condition of the old building. Right. Um, we have met every other criteria. And as you know, and I know, the most recent NASDAQ update came out in January right. um, and was sent to us. And they said we'd still have to remain on warning because we had not yet to open the building. And right. in theory, you're supposed to wait another six or seven months in order to update them. But we're trying to bypass that process and do it immediately. Um, all right, we have everything ready to go um, to be able to share in with NIASC that um, that showing that the building has been, you're absolutely right, Mr. Young, that the progress report was due on February 1st. Um, and because we were not in the building yet, I had written a letter, sent pictures, and, um, and because we were actually physically not in the building yet, um, they would not um, accept our progress report as completed. Um, so I'm hopeful that with this next one that is coming up, that it will be officially done. Thank you. I just wanted to point that yeah. out. This people understood that. Um, other questions for Paul? Rich Oakley, go right ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Brannigan. And also, uh, thanks for putting on a, an awesome show uh, for graduation. I thought everything just went really well. Uh, of course, there are a lot of people involved, but I just wanted to thank you um, in particular. Thank you. Um, yeah, just some highlights that I thought sound really great. Uh, number one, right off the bat, I love that you have students on the the uh, council with you, uh, ninth grader and 11th, if I remember right. Yep. Um, uh, I love the fact that you use the COVID-19 response plan as kind of a, a all-encompassing um, piece of this. And I, I noticed that on every single goal, you had a COVID-19 response plan section because, uh, you know, whether we like it or not, it's going to, uh, there's recovery to be had. So, um, thank you for thinking of it in that way. Um, in addition, speaking of COVID-19, um, I thought the the reintegration plan, uh, awesome stuff. I mean, it's it would be uh, short-sighted to assume that there was no reintegration that was needed. Um, so anyway, I'll be very, very interested to watch that uh, play out. And um, th so those are my highlights, I guess. Um, the question I had for you was, uh, there were just a couple questions probably relating to the fact that I'm not an educator. Um, but the, one of the questions I had was, um, these words stood out to me. Um, what is the modern classroom project? Right. So, um, thank you for asking that question. Um, the modern classroom project was actually an initiative that we started in the fall. Um, and really it's a testament to, um, Vicki Miles, our mm -hmm. mathematics department chair and, and, and Dr. Gates. And really what it is, it's really, um, a, a really a blended learning approach of really looking at the engagement of using technology in the classroom and actually using technology as the platform, which we did. And really it has, it, um, part of the work of those 10 days back in September 
um, was really the beginnings of teachers' engagement and building of using the Modern Classroom Project as their foundational work for hybrid learning and remote learning. And I got to tell you, um, some of the work that has been done up here in regards of using the Modern Classroom Project has been absolutely outstanding. And so it's really taking that the tenants of really that Modern Classroom Project and now carrying it into a year where now we're, we're kind of back in action. And so it's taking all these things that we found were really quite successful and, and saying, why would we get rid of it if we're kind of back now live in front of each other? Are there still pieces that can be pulled in um, because of really just some of the tremendous work that have been created throughout the building? Hmm. Excellent. All right. Well, yeah, thank you very much. And um, I also, Mr. Chair, if it's okay, just one more question. Um, the the um, on, on page 30, and, and I think it was mentioned elsewhere too, um, uh, create protocols for COVID-19 uh, 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 sorry, school year 21, 22, um, COVID-19 protocols if necessary. And I just wanted to ask you, am I right in assuming that, um, you know, we all kind of saw how things played out this past year and how recommendations would be provided very close to when they were expected to be implemented. But is it safe to say that it is easier to remove protocols than it is to add them? And it, um, given that, the uncertainty of the summer. Are, are you pretty comfortable that uh, we're going to plan for things being the way they are now, but happily remove uh, if we hear that? Yeah. So we at the high school level, we have already in terms of even our scheduling um, that we are scheduling as, you know, for full classes um, and really moving in that direction. Um, and as always, you know, you don't know what we don't know. And and so we need to be able to pivot if we need to. Um, and I think if if there's a group, if there's a profession that's learned to pivot, um, it has been this one. So I think as we need to evolve, we do. Um, but from based upon what has been um, shared in guidance from uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, um, that it seems as though that, you know, the, the sky is to look forward ahead to um, what it was before. It. So that's the hope. Great. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, other questions? questions? Well, thank you, Mr. Brennigan. Appreciate thank it. You. And all the work you and your committee, your council, I should have say, have done. Um, I would point out to the school committee that the uh, same law I quoted from at the beginning, which is Master, Mass General Law Chapter 71, Section 59C also has in it, and I quote, each school improvement plan shall be submitted to the school committee for review and approval every year. Um, it goes on to say if said school improvement plan is not reviewed by the school committee within 30 days of said school committee receiving said school improvement plan, the plan shall be deemed to have been approved, but we are certainly within that time frame. So um, this requires school committee action. And uh, so the chair would entertain a motion to approve all um, improvement plans presented tonight. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion. Uh, other than I, I do want to thank every member of those committees. I, I've i served in the past on school improvement plans. Um, I can just imagine how difficult it is not to physically be in the school and do a lot of the pieces on um, – on uh, virtual, so I want to thank them for that, and I want to thank them for their dedication and hard work. And with that, I will move to a vote. Mr. Mr. Aye. Aye. Mr. Lewis. Aye. Mr. Stevens. Aye. Ms. Farley. Aye. And the chair votes aye. It's unanimous. Thank you, everybody. And that concludes my report for this evening. Thank you very much, uh, Superintendent Lynch. I'm going to move on to a couple things. That uh, our next item on our agenda is our next meeting, which is June 24th, the school committee meeting. I just want to explain uh, the particular parameters that are going down. That meeting will be live um, and in person. Um, currently, the governor's uh, extension of plans and allowing remote participation and access end June 15th. Um, there is a bill in the Senate right now that the governor pushed to extend a wide variety of COVID plans um, through uh, the summer and into September or October. Uh, but if a member wanted to participate remotely, as of this moment, I do not have the capacity to do that. 
uh, just so everybody knows that particular piece. So we will meet remotely. I have had a conversation all today with uh, Mr. Siciliano. Uh, we are going to meet in the auditorium at the high school. Um, our plan was to transfer over to the high school. It is also after the students have left. So there are uh, some parameters, but I do have to check about parameters that we have to follow being that the guidelines are still in place. So I have to check those pieces and I'll get back to everybody and make it known. But our plan is the June 24th meeting to be at the high school, the new high school. Anyone have any questions about that? And as I get more information, I will obviously share it with the full committee and the community. Mr. Stevens, go right ahead. Uh, what's the current plan? Uh, I mean, a lot of people have been watching us on Facebook um, and other other devices or, or streaming. Is there a plan to continue that? Uh, yeah, that? so our plan had always been to continue it as everyone I think can imagine and I hope will understand. Uh, there will probably be a little, few glitches here and there along the way. Um, you know, where the plan was always to allow uh, to for us to try to be able to continue the participation. Um, we believe that obviously the new building set up to allow that access. Um, it's just like I said, there might be pieces of glitches that we go through at the very beginning, but the plan is to do it on the same forums. Plus, um, people can come in person at this time if they wish to and make public comments or to comment on pieces of our agenda. So that is uh, open to them. Um, again, those what the audience has to do as far as spacing and everything like that, I still have to go through guidelines for DESI and, uh, and pieces like that. So I just have to make sure we have all those in place and get ready to do that. But that's the plan. And so it has always been our hope to continue it, Greg. Yeah. Um, how about us for, are we going to be six feet apart without masks? Like, do you know how that's going to work? Yeah, we're going to use the stage um, of the new high school. So we will be separated. I'm not 100% certain what the exact separation will be, but we will be separated. Okay. Uh, we are moving to roughly four tables. Um, so we'll spread those out in different ways and um it'll be the usual crowd but spread out over four tables if you will greg so that's the that's the piece i have any further questions all good questions um seeing no one i will move on again um i apologize i meant to have subcommittees but we get stuck on a few things this week with the, i'll ha have subcommittees we haven't had a need for a subcommittee immediately so i'm not that uh, concerned about it, but I will make sure everybody gets that. Um, Middleville High School Building Project, the uh, building committee met yesterday. Um, we are at 93% completion. Um, the demolition of the old school has, I believe, roughly about seven full days of demolition to get done. Um, and they do it was stopped. They do it in stages. They're doing it in three stages. The stage two, um, is next and the stage three, the final piece is the section of the building that is the gymnasium, the old gymnasium. Um, so that will probably be down by the end of, uh, by the beginning of July, correct, Brian? If, if I know you attend the the regular yeah, meeting. That, that is correct, that's the plan currently. Yeah, so that'll be done. Um, one thing I think that I should mention that people, uh, a former uh, school committee member, Mr. Brian Gimbanoni brought up um, that was a part of chats, and I know Mr. Oakley mentioned to me in passing, um, and we really haven't had a chance to talk about it, but he did let me know. Uh, they did bring up the track. Um, it has always been our plan uh, since we started this whole project that the track will be open to people. Um, we are going to have that conversation, but again, this is still a construction project. Um, there are fences up all over the place. Uh, one of the questions that came up is sort of a well, why do you let the kids use it and not other people? Quite frankly, we have control over the kids, right? So, uh, for example, at the demolition of the high school, there are two firefighters stationed there uh, as part of the contract to watch that building come down. If they were to think a piece was unsafe for kids to be outside, kids wouldn't be outside uh, during that time of day. Or, well, you know, we work it around it. Um, Sometimes you can't do that with people just out wandering the track. So it is still a construction site. It will be treated as such. But again, there has been, you know, I have not had a single person, at, everybody who has asked me in the past, I haven't probably had a person ask me in a year, 
if we're going to open the high school, uh, open the track for the community, the answer has always been yes. That was always the discussion we had from the beginning. That's the conversation we had with the community when we sold the building. Um, you know, we sold the plans for the building and explained everything. But there will be differences, right? I mean, the track is in the middle of a stadium complex. So it, it will not be open 24 seven like you could at the old track where you could go out in the back and wander around. Uh, there will be posted times and everything like that, but it will be open to the community. So how people have gotten that it's not going to be, I have no idea. And that has never been a single time I've said anything about that. So it did come at the building committee meeting and Rich, you had mentioned it to me. So I wanted to bring it up tonight. Um, any other questions about building committee? I, I, I will add that we are under budget um, roughly by about $2 million currently. R Rich, go right ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, you answered my first question right there with the budget. Um, that's that's great. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Now, does the the ninety three percent completion number that you mentioned um, does that include the demolition? Um, would the the remaining seven percent be the demolition, or if not, what is the remaining seven percent? So the remaining seven uh, percent includes the demolition, includes the creation of where the site is right now. Where the old site is would be a parking lot. There is another softball field to be created. Mm -hmm. um, there's various pieces. And also mm -hmm. there is, uh, I'm going to put it this way, non, a non-essential punch list for the new high school uh, that most of that will take place at, at the, during the summertime when the kids are out. Brian, go right ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, I just want to share the fact that, that once the building is taken down, uh, a huge parking lot will be constructed there. Uh, which will take the large part of time until probably October 4th. That's the targeted date here. There'll be a JV softball field built approximately where the current parking for the gym is, which will be next to the right of the track. And then out behind where a lot of parking is going on right now, that's going to be tennis courts. So those tennis courts will be built there. And then out behind where there's dirt and soil mound up, where the JV field sort of ends, that will be continued sod until – until the back up until the back corner and that will be the lacrosse field um, so there's a good deal more land development that needs to go on uh, very little inside the building uh, just punch list items but there's still a lot to go out on the grounds and, and what's happening and that is all included including the demolition of the current building included as part of the completion of the project which is scheduled for October 4th is the target date excellent thank you both very much one other thing that came up that I should mention to people is because of COVID protocols, um, we have had um, pitting on our steel on the handrails in um, several of the railings going all throughout. We are going to replace those railings. Um, the Because everything had to be consistently wiped down, um, some of the solvent caused problems with the steel. Um, so we are going to replace those with stainless. Um, that's what we voted to at the last meeting. And those that additional money will be picked up by the COVID um, CARES Act. So we'll be putting that through the COVID CARES Act. And part of it was uh, the reason we did move so quickly on it was because we can get the product, get the steel in, and have it done over the summertime. So, again, that's a project that um, – there's nothing wrong with the with the um, railings other than, you know, there's a defect on them and we don't want to see it continue and we don't want to deal with it. So we want to make sure that they're fixed and completed. Any other questions about uh, the building committee? Cool. Um, uh, just also a reminder that the MASC, MASS convention is still November 3rd through 6th. Um, we have, um, I believe it's usually uh, by the time July rolls around, there's a, um, a reduced rate. So that's why I keep keep it on there for people. And last but not least, Brian, do you want to talk, talk about the technology surplus? Uh, that's a list of surplus that's been developed by the te technology staff through Dr. Gates uh, of material that is no longer has useful purpose for the school and the school department. Um, we are working on a plan to repurpose some of this and offer it up to community members uh, and students. 
So if there's still some life in these computers, uh, to have them go out with no guarantees or warranties to, to families that might uh, take advantage of that. So uh, we will be working on that in the future. Um, but these are no longer of use to our school system. So that's why they're being declared surplus this evening. Um, Brian, just for my recollection, even though we declare them surplus, right? Don't they first have to go to other towns and other town departments? They before? would all be offered to other town departments. And then, then they would be uh, at the next stage, which is sort of that disposal piece. But, uh, yeah. you know, if we can find homes for them and find homes for the equipment, we certainly will. That's fantastic. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I was not incorrect about that. Do you want a motion tonight to uh, approve the the disposal of items? Uh, if you approve approve them as surplus, it just kicks that policy in. Okay. Yep. So with that, the chair would enter a motion. So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Oakley? Aye. Um, Mr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Stevens? Aye. Ms. Farley? Aye. And the chair votes aye. It's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, with that, does anyone have anything they want to bring up before we adjourn? Seeing no one, chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a second. Mr. Oakley? Aye. Mr. Lewis? Aye. Mr. Stevens? Aye. Ms. Farley? Aye. And the chair votes aye. And thanks, everybody. And we hope to see a lot of you in person at our next meeting on the uh, 24th. Mm -hmm. 24th. Thank you very much, everybody. And have a great night. Good night, everybody.